It's time to start screaming. <laughs> Man, it is so hot. Looks like you got three weeks, bro. <clears throat> so today, we're on American power and the new mandarins. Learning about the United States war on Southeast Asia. Of the political and moral character of the war, the international reaction there. 224. The logic of withdrawal. Justifications that are offered for persisting in the semi principe led, semi lunatic course of action in which we are now so heavily engaged. His general thesis seems to me entirely correct. The issues are so grave that I would like to go well beyond the bounds of a review and indicate some of the directions in which his discussion might be extended and elaborated. What is the situation that American policymakers face in mid-1996-7? The American military takeover of pacification is a testimony to the failure, thus far, of the effort to impose a political solution by force on an unwilling population. Its true significance is tastefully indicated by an unnamed American official in Saigon who comments, We've been playing the be nice to the Asian game for 10 years, and it's been a flop. We can't afford it any longer. 5. The American Chief of Civil Operations in the northernmost provinces attributes the failure of the Revolution Mitterdotionary Development Teams to the overwhelming corruption of Vietnamese official life to the failure to understand that until there is a contented peasantry there is no room for the opulent society of the government of Vietnam. Sixth same report in the Times goes on to give a dramatic example of the results of this corruption. It comments on the successful attack by a villa force on the province capital of Pintri on April 6 and continues a few days later in a series of events that were not fully reported at the time, the guerrillas moved virtually unmolested into Hu while the army and the national police did a remarkable event. Its significance indicated by the fact that it was kept from the American people at the time and still has not been frankly discussed. In Saigon itself, there are clear indications of the same demoralization or widespread involvement in guerrilla activity times. For example, on February 1, 1967, Westmoreland's headquarters in central Saigon were subjected to a mortar attack. And 225. American Power AND the NU Man RINS. The New York Times points out, with considerable understatement, this attack gives rise to a question of the popular support in Saigon for the South Vietnamese government. It seemed unlikely to observers that the 81mm mortar and the shells could have been transported to the house, that the roof could have been cut and the weapon set up without detection by someone in the crowded residential district. Until the shells were fired, no one called the police. Current reports confirm once again, that every program to win the allegiance of the countryside for the South Vietnamese government has so far failed, in the opinion of most observers. To this day, 80% of the peasantry falls under Viet Cong influence if not outright control. 7. The very terminology of this report gives some insight into the reasons for the recurrent failure. It has yet to be demonstrated that the Americans are correct in their unquestioned assumption that the peasants of Vietnam are not incapable of political expression or aljons to be controlled by one side or the other. The report continues, if the South Vietnamese themselves cannot achieve support for the government among their own people, it is unlikely that giant white foreigners will be able to do this for them. Yet it is just this attempt to which we are now reduced with the military takeover. And we can be fairly sure that this latest step will lead to new and glorious reports of success before the next true awakening. The Saigon government has few illusions as to its legitimacy and status. 
Saigon officials have pointed out repeatedly that they cannot survive in an open political arena and that therefore the Americans must destroy not only the Viet Cong military unit but also its political and administrative structure by such devices as the pacification program. A clear and forthright expression of this analysis appears in an interview with one of 228. The logic of withdrawal. The top generals in the junta, a man regarded by US officials as politically the most sophisticated of the group, reported by George M. Cahin in a memorandum to a group of senators. Eight, the general describes the situation in the following terms. To defeat the communists we must win against them both politically and militarily. But we are very weak politically and without the strong political support of the population which the NLF have. First now if we defeat them militarily, they can come to power because of their greater political strength. We now have, thanks to the support of our allies, a strong military instrument. But we are without a political instrument that can compete with the communists in the south. Such a political instrument we must now begin to create, a process that will take a generation. It is unrealistic to speak of a ceasefire until after we have built up our political strength to the point where we can compete with the communists successfully. He goes on to say that the war must be carried to North Vietnam with the commitment of a million American troops, then probably to China as well. Finally, he argues that it might be necessary to move on to backslash vault backslash VA3 so as to ensure that communist power was fully removed from Vietnam, a not unrealistic forecast. If the United States continues to insist that its protégés be spared the defeat that they know to be a certainty if the struggle is ever permitted to shift to the political arena, where they lack the strong political support of the population which the NLF have. Buddhist leaders appear to share this analysis. In the cited memorandum, Kahing quotes Buddhist spokesman, obviously unidentified, who point out that the present Saigon regime, dependent for its life on United States support, can do nothing to win the war. They plead that the United States lift the tight lid that is clamped on political expression and political activity so that a government with some claim to legitimacy can. 221. A Marathi power and the enemy manda are INF be established, one that can proceed to make a political settlement with the National Liberation Front. Despite the outrageous suppression of Buddhist political activity, the Buddhists still appear to be confident, as they have been for years, that they can function effectively in cooperation with the NLF. The recent policy statement published by the Overseas Vietnamese Buddhist Association emphasizes this as does the Tet Middle Dot in an pathetic book by Fitch and Hat Han, Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire, and, in fact, puts forth a program for South Vietnam that is not markedly different from that of the NLF. American authorities have repeatedly indicated that they share this assessment of the Saigon government and its popular base. Both the present Assistant Secretary of State for Far East Foreign Affairs and his predecessor have expressed their belief that the neutralization of South Vietnam would lead to a communist takeover, and it is widely admitted that the American Expeditionary Force was introduced to stave off what was in essence a political defeat. In his revealing study of the Viet Cong, American Foreign Service Officer Douglas Pike concludes, with ample evidence, that the NLF victory in the now long forgotten civil war was essentially a political and organizational victory achieved by building a mass movement. The NLF, he states, is the only truly mass-based political party in South Vietnam. Only the Buddhists whose political organization was smashed in the spring of 1966 could realistically hope to take part in a coalition with the NLF. In his judgment, General Richard Stilwell, at the time second in command in the Southeast Asian Theatre, informed Senator Yen that we are putting down an insurrection, and even General Westmoreland, 
who now asserts that he has seen no signs of insurrection, admitted to Senator Young that the majority of the Viet Cong fighting in the Mekong Delta were born and reared the 9th, thus indicating that 228. The logic of withdrawal. He may not know the meaning of the word insurrection. The basis for the success of the insurrection is not very obscure. Dennis Warner, as anti-communist as any newsman who has worked in Southeast Asia, pointed out years ago that in hundreds of villages all over Southeast Asia the only people working at the grassroots for an uplift in people's living standards are the communists. 10. And to the communist agit prop successes, the Americans have contributed mightily. For ex Mikudor Tampel, with a terroristic bombing policy, American sources indicate that in the first year of American bombing of the South, 1965, local recruitment for the Viet Cong Triple.11, the head of the Saigon office of Asahi Shinbun, feels that it is certain that the escalation and spread of the war even though its results may be advantageous to the Saigon government itself, only serves to heighten still further opposition to the war among the general population, adding that the number of draft dodgers and deserters among young South Vietnamese is a sign of the failure of the war, by and large, to win the support of young people who tend to view it as an American war. Twelve of the situation can only worsen. Saigon authorities indicate that there are now some 2 million refugees, most of them, according to the reports of war correspondents, victims of American bombardment or forced resettlement. An Associated Press report from Saigon gives the following shattering forecast. United States High Command occupied for two years with hunting down North Vietnamese regulars, now is looking more towards the populated valleys and lowlands where the enemy wields potent political influence and gets his sustain. Quick gains are hoped for by forced resettlement of chronically communist areas, followed up with scorched earth operations that deny enemy troops all food, shelter, and material support. Central Highlands Valley are being denuded of all living things. People bringing the communist war zones in south have been moved. 229. American Power AND the enemy manned R. Brian F. Some American observers recently in the Mekong Delta say that the Vietnamese army, long hated and feared, now is regarded as less of a threat to the countryside and the Americans.13. Dozens of such reports can be cited. Those who advocate withdraw Allah simply proposing that we eliminate this threat, as only we can do. It is hardly surprising that the peasantry refuses allegiance to a constituent assembly that could muster three votes out of 117 for the one land reform measure that was introduced or that even the residents of Saigon now less than enthusiastic about the government so unbelievably corrupt that the Secretary of Industry in his cabinet seems to be the major supplier of drugs to the Viet Cong of course, after receiving a third of a million dollars in kickbacks from the American and West German suppliers. Don't you know is it obscure why the American government continues to use its military force to impose on the people of Vietnam the regime of the most corrupt, most reactionary element in Vietnamese society. There is simply no one else who will do its binding and resist the overwhelming popular sentiment for peace and, no doubt, neutralism. The United States government has on occasion indicated that it would not leave if asked to do so by a left-wing or even neutralist government that, in the US view, did not reflect the true feelings of the South Vietnamese people or military leaders. 15. Furthermore, it will see to it that no such government will arise, and that no such opinions will be publicly expressed. Thus, in the last few months, reports from South Vietnam indicate that once again a Buddhist attempt to establish a legal political organization were frustrated and the leaders arrested. Cahin Memorandum, cited above, note 8. Jean Raffaele, 
the one Western correspondent who has remained in North Vietnam has observed that quite apart from 230. The logic of withdrawal. Any question of politics, there is a human element of grandeur in the resistance of the Vietnamese to the assault launched against them by the world's most advanced technology. In Le Mans, a North Vietnamese doctor of international reputation is quoted as saying, Dot. The Americans have demolished everything. All that we have built since 1954 is in ruins, hospitals, schools, factories, new dwellings. We have nothing more to lose except for independence and liberty. But to safeguard these, believe me, we are ready to endure anything. In South Vietnam, the American attack has been far more severe and direct reports from its victims is lacking. But some statistics tell the story well enough. According to American sources, the Viet Cong are able to enlist an estimated 7,000 recruits a month. 16 recently, an extensive propaganda barrage has enthusiastically proclaimed that in March 1st, 967, there were 5,557 defectors from the Viet Cong, almost twice as many as in any previous month. Only the careful reader would have noted that of these defectors, 630 were identified as military men and 301 as political cadres. The rest being peasants, probably coming for a free meal. Dot seventeen seven thousand new recruits and six hundred and thirty defectors. These figures indicate graphically by what means the American war in Vietnam must be won. The preceding description is based on reports in early 1967. Rereading IT in January 1st, 968. I need hardly emphasize how little the situation has changed. The savage battering of the Vietnamese continues without fault and scale. It is unique in the history of warfare. We learned that aerial bombardment can only exceed 100 pounds of explosives per person, 12 tons of explosives the square mile, distributed almost equally between North and South Vietnam. Hundreds of thousands of acres have been subjected to defoliation, with what ultimate consequences? No. 231. A Murai California and Power and the Enlander are Brianna. One knows. Refugees in South Vietnam are counted in the millions. Why have they left their homes? The reason why the people are forced to abandon their villages and their homes is because, in most cases, practically all of the homes are completely burned to the ground by the American forces. However, the people still try to cling to their scorched land and are removed only by compulsion. 18 literate Americans, those who have followed the well-reported horror story of Ben Su, for example, can supply the details for themselves. 19 numerous eyewitness reports have given the light of the cynical pretense that our targets in North Vietnam are purely military targets of steel and concrete. The chief editorial writer of Asahi Sky and Ben Wright, I myself walked around and inspected the bombed remains of schools hospitals, churches, temples, market places, and other peaceful public facilities. 20 Lee Lockwood, Harrison Salisbury, David Sernbrunn, and others have elaborated. For those who wish to know, it is no longer denied that anti-personnel weapons constitute a significant proportion of the bombing. The political situation remains as before. Elections have been held to legitimize the existing regime in American eyes, at least. To ensure the proper results, the only avowed peace candidate, Oh Duong Than, was ruled off the ballot, as was the candidate most likely to be a threat at the polls, General Min. He had previously been barred from the country. Communists and neutralists were excluded by electoral law. In the senatorial elections, Tickets associated with striking Buddhists were excluded as pro materialists and the trade union ticket was eliminated because one candidate lacked certification of his legal status. 21 As anticipated, the candidates are generally an aristocratic and urban group, 
including few villages, about 90% of them live within Saigon North, the surrounding province of 232. The logic of withdrawal. Jaya Jin. 22 the shenanigans involved in deciding who won the senatorial elections defy description. 23 although a number of American political scientists declared themselves satisfied, recalling Dean Rusk's description of the May 1965 provincial elections as free elections. By our standards, the Special Committee of the South Vietnamese Constituent Assembly recommended to invalidate the decision was reversed by a vote of 58-43 in the full assembly, and a police guard, with the director of the National Police, General Lone, and his armed bodyguard, conspicuously in the gallery. Ban Hak Su U, the consecutive landowner who was assembly speaker, refused to announce the result, saying, I am absolutely unwilling to accept the verdict. 24 shortly after the elections, Duong Ding Zhu, who surprised everyone by speaking of peace and who placed second in the balloting, was arrested. Also arrested was O Duong Than, by 79 armed men in combat being led by General Lone. 25 among the charges, he had applied for an exit visa to the United States. It is up to him to explain why he wants to go abroad, stated General Lone. After being held for 18 hours, he was returned to house arrest, where apparently he remained, though it is difficult to obtain information. On November 3, the Saigon government freed 6,270 prisoners in an amnesty, including 4,320 Viet Cong suspects, most of them peasants, and one, 120 political detainees, persons who have been held, usually without trial, for periods up to three years. A ranking official said, it's safe to say that only a tiny fraction of the total was released Wednesday. The government refuses to give further information. Furthermore, it is by now also clear that the government, in the months since the elections, has fallen into the almost total paralysis, the only noticeable action being the intensive effort by the House to block the attempt to draft South Vietnamese. 233. American Power A.N.D. The N.U. Manda R. Ryan F. Boys of 18 and 19 to fight the American war. Tran Van Du, the foreign minister, explains that we are not able to organize South Vietnam politically, so we cannot accept the NLF as a political party. The integration of the front will be a political way to take over South Vietnam. 26. The Mekong Delta, with 40% of the population, and as yet, no North Vietnamese soldiers, continues to be a veered from strongholds. Asked why, President Singh. The main reason the Viet Middle Dot Cong remains so strongly entrenched in the Mekong Delta is that people there still believe there is little difference between the French whom they called colonialists, and the Americans whom they call imperialists. 27. Another reason is pointed out by Congressman Reed, who notes that 70% of the tenant farmers of the lowland and Mekong Delta now rent from absentee landlords who are living it up in Saigon. 28. The attempt by Congressman Reed and Moster have the government release a detailed study of land measures in South Vietnam by the General Accounting Office has so far been unsuccessful. 29. Tran Van Du's analysis is confirmed by Hansen Baldwin, who reports that almost unanimously, U.S. officials in Vietnam view the prospect of imminent negotiations with alarm because inclusion of the NLF in a coalition would be the kiss of death. 30. This attitude towards a negotiated settlement reveals itself continually in American diplomacy, with its constant posing of new, more extreme conditions whenever an opportunity for negotiations arises as in the Ho Chi Minh Johnson exchange of February 1967, when President Johnson proposed, as a condition for negotiation, that we should stop augmenting our forces in South Vietnam after North Vietnam had stopped all infiltration. We, of course, 
would be free to continue our own supply and infiltration operations for our own far more extensive expeditionary forces, even after the 234. The logic of withdrawal. North Vietnamese desisted totally. Occasionally, spokesmen for the American government have expressed themselves quite clearly about the prospects for negotiations. For example, General Maxwell Taylor stated in August 1st, 965. Dot. The army is the power in South Vietnam. The generals are completely committed. They've burned all their bridges behind them. They would never tolerate a government that was caught surreptitiously or overtly negotiating with Hanoi or with the Viet Cong. 81. It seems unlikely that either Saigon nor Washington will be trapped into negotiations, so long as the political base of those who collaborate with us in South Vietnam remains as weak as it is today. Corroborating Hansen Baldwin Summary of Opinion in Vietnam, Hedrick Smith reports from Washington that the recent elections did not produce an organized political base for the government and, in the opinion of United States policymakers, the Saigon regime lacked sufficient popular support and cohesion to enter a political test of strength with the front. 32 the elections, although they may have temporarily calmed American public opinion, have changed little or nothing in South Vietnam. An internal report of the United States Ms. Cyan 33 in Saigon reports the gloom of American officials over the strange drift from reality regarding the U.S. role in Vietnam among the South Vietnamese people, as evidence. For example, in the statement by a group of middle-aged citizens that a new mobilization law had been enacted at the behest of the Americans, whose relay is the extermination of as many Vietnamese as possible, or the question of a legislator who asks, why should our young men be drafted to serve U.S. interests? The mood among Saigon intellectuals is summarized by a 235. American Power and the Enumanda R. Brian F. Retired professor who is somewhat to the right in the spectrum of Saigon intellectuals. 34. The problem, he states, is that at this point the only intellectuals of character who have committed themselves are on the other side. Ho Chi Minh retains his popularity because he bridged the gap between Vietnam and the modern world. Everyone knows and admires Ho. The only hope, as the professor sees it, is for the United States to put aside pretense and to appoint a new governor or proconsul for Vietnam. As far as the military situation is concerned, Senator Mansfield, one of the best informed members of the Senate on Southeast Asian affairs, concluded after General Westmoreland's recent reports in Washington that he saw very little, if anything, in the pattern of combat operations to indicate any weakening of the ability of the Viet Cong to keep on fighting. He believes that the NLF remains the dominant force in South Vietnam, and points out that its stronghold in the Mekong Delta has hardly been touched. The front, rather than Hanoi, is the main factor to be considered in South Vietnam. 30. There are, to be sure, certain pacified areas, some even with few American troops, for example, much of Tain in province, were there. Khao Dai is quite strong, but it is interesting to interrogate the details of this success in pacification. Elizabeth Bond reports that the basis appears to be a certain accommodation between the Khao Dai and the Viet Cong. 36. Among the Khao Dai intellectuals, the heroes remain those who advocated neutralism particularly the former Khao Dai Po, Pham Kong Tak, who was exiled under Diem. Bison, the only one who has carried on the tradition of Pham Kong Tak, is considered to be Major Kuai Phan Mum, who joined the Viet Cong with his Khao Dai troops. The relation between this model. 236. The logic of withdrawal. Area and the Saigon government is one of strong mutual mistrust, according to this report. 
there has been no more revealing commentary on the situation in the American-controlled areas of South Vietnam than the testimony elicited by Congressman Donald Regal from Rutherford Post in May 1967, released in September 37. Mr. Post has been, for the preceding three years, the number one man overseeing our economic program the so-called other war in Vietnam, and had just been promoted to deputy director of the Agency for International Development. According to this testimony, as Congressman Regal reports it, the annual U.S. commodity import program in Vietnam is actually a ransom paid to powerful South Vietnamese commercial and tourists to ensure political stability in South Vietnam and ensure their continued support of the war. Coates agreed with Congressman Regal's summary statement that if we were to withdraw our aid program, the government would likely collapse over there, and for all intents and purposes the war would be over, and that if this war were conducted in a way that required great economic sacrifices by certain elements in Vietnam, the political instability is such that the country might fly apart. The situation is such that there would not be military action by the Vietnamese military forces today had it not been for our provision of commercial imports because of the resulting inflation, disruption and loss of morale. He also agreed that there is certainly a substantial element of truth in Congressman Regal's judgment that without the ransom, commercial interests in South Vietnam would get their sympathizers out in the streets and bring down the government, though he felt this judgment to be harsh. Congressman Regal concludes that if we cannot establish some sort of balance, 237. American Power and THEN Umanda R. Ryan F. And between self sufficiency versus a growing dependency, then we will never get out of this situation. We will be mired down the forever. He adds that all the evidence that piles up on the military side and on the non-military side shows a growing dependency. According to Mr. Potts, that is certainly a danger, and in some instances a fair conclusion. It would follow, then, if this assessment is accurate, that we will be mired down the forever. One might compare this testimony with a report by the French resident minister in 1897. The only collaborators are intriguers, disreputable or ignorant, whom we, the French, had rigged out with sometimes high rank, which became tools in their hands for plundering the country without scruple. Despised, they possessed neither the spiritual culture nor the moral fiber that would have allowed them to understand and carry out their task. 38. Apart from its rhetorical flair, this might be the testimony of Rutherford Potts today. Mr. Potts's testimony will come as no surprise to those who have been paying attention to the laments of senior American officials in Saigon. In 1959, one such official, 39, commented that in the case of Free Vietnam the lack of even a bare minimum of economic self-sufficiency makes enduring political independence only an illusion, and complained that the majority of the aid is used in a manner that maintains an extravagant standard of living. The Viet Minh, he said, can make a strong case that the United States is effectively replacing France as the new master of Free Vietnam. Boats's testimony simply shows how little things have changed. Many additional illustrations of the character of the collaborationist element might be cited. Forty, the whole situation recalls vividly other episodes in the history of colonialism. For one example, the situation in the Philippines during the period of 238. The logic of withdrawal. The Japanese occupation. The prospect are for deepening misery and still further devastation, so long as the American occupation continues. Christopher Lydon, 
the Boston Globe correspondent who AC Company General Gavin on his recent trip to Vietnam concluded a series of articles reporting his impressions with a quotation from Tan Thuc Nguyen, managing editor of the Vietnam Guardian, which was suppressed by the Saigon regime when it printed a report questioning the official claim that Assembly member Tran Van Van was assassinated by the Viet Cong. Nguyen defined what he sees as the only possible American victory. You cannot defeat the other side militarily unless you devote the next 30 or 40 years to it. You can win if you keep killing for a generation. You simply exterminate all the Vietnamese the way you kill the Indians and men who in there will be no more of you. Right on comment. This agony, if not at a desperation, among what seemed to me the most sensitive and patriotic Vietnamese about the burden of American arms on their country is the overriding impression I carry back from this tortured capital. 41 This agony is shared by the most perceptive observers of the Vietnam tragedy, even those who are basically in support of the American military intervention. Bernard Paul, for example, in one of his last articles warned that it is Vietnam as a cultural and historic entity which is threatened with extinction as the countryside literally dies under the blows of the largest military machine ever unleashed on an area of this size. 42 It is appalling beyond words that we permit this to continue. When one tries to see what lies behind the official government report, this is the sort of picture that emerges. Of course, it is not the picture that the government seeks to present, nor the one that it succeeds, by and large, in presenting. Given there. 239. AMER I California and Power A and B T H E N U Manda R Ryanet. Enormous propaganda apparatus at its command. It is to the great credit of the American press that it does still provide information on the basis of which one who is willing to put in the time and effort can arrive at some understanding of what is taking place in Vietnam. But we must recognize that valuable as this is, it has little bearing on the state of American democracy, since the opportunity to do the research that is required to separate fact from propaganda is limited to a privileged few. In the light of what we have seen in the past three years, it is difficult to become excited over such matters as the ambiguity or duplicity of the American government position on the Geneva Agreement or the numerous violations of domestic and international law that have accompanied our intervention in the internal affairs of Vietnam. Nevertheless, these matters, and in particular the reaction as they have become too clear to overlook, are quite revealing for anyone concerned with the American war in Vietnam and its implications from the future. It was, at one time, quite normal to denounce the communists for their disregard of international law and treaty obligations. Now, however, many Americans tend to scoff at such matters as irrelevant, unrealistic. Suddenly, the constitution and the system of treaties to which we have committed ourselves, the United Nations Charter in particular have become outmoded inappropriate to the complexities of current history, which require a powerful executive, re to react with overwhelming military force to re laurel edged emergencies and attacks such as the alleged Tonkin Bay attack. In the world dominant power, this disregard for the formalities must cause very great concern. Randolph Bourne once warned of the intellectuals who tell us that our war in all wars is stainless and thrillingly achieving the good. We have a right to become even more alarmed when. 204. The logic of withdrawal. They tell us, not in so many words, to be sure, but by the policy they advocate that our national self-interest requires that we tear to shreds the delicate fabric of international law and disregard our treaty commitments and constitutional processes. Granting the inadequacy and frequent injustice of international law and the institutions set up to give it substance, there is still much truth in the conclusion of the Lawyers' Committee on American Policy in Vietnam. The tragedy in Vietnam reveals that the rules of law 
went so flagrantly disregarded, have a way of reasserting the calm wisdom underlying their creation. If international law had been followed, both Vietnam and the American people would have been spared what Secretary General Yu Thant has described as one of the most barbarous wars in history. 43. The disregard for law and treaty was illustrated strikingly by our behavior with respect to the Geneva Agreements of 1954. Much has been made of the fact that in a technical sense we did not clearly commit ourselves to uphold these agreements. The record, however, must not be forgotten by those who are concerned to restore a measure of decency to our international behavior. At Geneva, Mr. Bedell Smith did explicitly commit the United States to observe the French middle dot of the Vietnamese agreement on cessation of hostilities and paragraphs 112 of the final declaration of the conference. Pointedly omitted was paragraph 13, which provided for consultations to ensure that the agreements are respected. An interesting omission in the light of subsequent attempts to achieve a negotiated settlement. The final declaration states that the military demarcation line is provisional and should not in any way be interpreted as constituting a political or territorial boundary and calls for elections under international control as part of a political settlement based on the principles of independence, unity and 241. A.M.E.R. I can parade N.D. The N.U. Manda R. Ryanet. Territorial integrity for all of Vietnam. Apparently, the United States had no intention of fulfilling its Geneva commitment, a fact that is admitted with remarkable frankness. For example, the Honorable Kenneth T. Young, Director of Southeast Asian Affairs in the State Department from 1954 to 1958 writes that in 1954 a reign was an independent South Vietnam with a strong government responsive to the nationalist aspirations of the population. 44. This reign was to violate our commitment at Geneva. This aim was part of our general program of trying to safeguard South Vietnam as part of the retainment of all or most of non-communist Asia, of helping the Vietnamese to create stability, security and prosperity south of the one South parallel so as to deter aggression and subversion from the North all in violation of our commitment at Geneva to a unified Vietnam with supervised elections in 1956. Obviously one could hardly have supposed that North Vietnam, prior to the scheduled elections in 1956, would carry out aggression and subversion, and as events were to prove, nothing Senator occurred in those years that could even remotely be construed in such terms. Despite the diemist repression and Diem's refusal, with our support, to undertake the 1955 consultations that were provided for by the Geneva Accord. Secretary Dulles, it will be recalled, went still further in his aim, as when he advised the French ambassador, prior to the conference, that above all, the deltas of the Red and Mekong rivers must be retained as bases from which a counter attack could recover what was lost to the Viet Minh at the conference table. 45 it would be interesting, though probably impossible, to trace the ways in which the United States and its Saigon ally acted on this concept. Bernard Fall claims, on what evidence he does not say, that constantly since 1956 inches, small abateur groups have been parachuted or infiltrated into North Vietnam, though. 242. The logic of withdrawals. The casualty rate is very high in success. If any, a few and far between. 46 Richard Goodwin dates these attempts from 1958.47 recall that even according to American propaganda, there was no serious threat in South Vietnam until 1959-60 when North Vietnam set in motion a systematic effort to seize control of South Vietnam by force. 
48. In fact, the American government claims only the infiltration of drains south of Vietnamese Cadiz began in 1959, even just prior the American takeover of the war in early 1965. Surveys of Viet Cong prisoners and defectors found most native South Vietnamese guerrillas unaware of any North Vietnamese role in the war, except as a valued ally. 49. A comparative study of the success of the South Vietnamese commandos in North Vietnam and the Northern trained South Vietnamese cadres sent to South Vietnam in the 1960s might provide an interesting commentary on some of the strange ideas about revolutionary guerrilla war that appear in current American propaganda. It is curious, incidentally, that today only the United States and their communists insist that South Vietnam is a separate and independent entity. The Saigon authorities maintain, in Article 1 of the new constitution, that Vietnam, not South Vietnam, is a territorially indivisible, unified and independent republic, of which they claim to be the rulers. Article 107 of the constitution specifies that Article 1 cannot be amended. Hence, in their wow, view, that's amazing. even if Ho Chi Minh were to have sent Very his entire good. army to South Vietnam, he would not What's have been exactly? guilty of aggression, but only of insurrection <laughs> and subversion. There is, however, a much more dangerous development than the falsification and cynicism of the American government with respect to its international commitments and to domestic and international law, namely the tolerance by even enlightened American opinion of the notion that we have a perfect right to. 243. Amurai California when power and the NUMANRINS intervene in the internal affairs of Vietnam to determine the legitimate elements in South Vietnamese society and to direct the development of social and political institutions of our choice in that unfortunate country. It is shameful but undeniable that the turmoil over the war in the United States would never have risen beyond a whisper had we met with success in our attempt to strengthen the police and security forces and other institutions contributing to a modern police state in South Vietnam. 51 is no longer even surprised to read the recommendation from a knowledgeable and quite liberal correspondent that the United States sought to send to Vietnam the best people it has at this sensitive businesses of political reorientation so that the field will not be left to the NLF. 111 as he points out, our Vietnamese are playing a power game both locally and in Saigon for their own special privileges and in tourists and they have little the contempt for the villagers. Therefore, we must find a way to win allegiance for them among the peasantry. Imagine how Saville Davis would react on reading such a recommendation in Pravda. Both he and his readers take for granted, however, that the United States has the right to carry out political reorientation, not to speak of the right to use military force anywhere in the world. The Vietnamese revolutionaries may or may not succeed in freeing their country from American domination, but they have already succeeded in shattering American complacency with regard to our international role. American power is so great that no outside force can call us to account. Hence the overwhelming urgency of the effort to overcome the effects of a generation of indoctrination and a long history of self-adulation. We will simply compound the tragedy of Vietnam if we do not exploit this opportunity to break loose from the stranglehold of ideal. 244. The logic of withdrawal and the tradition of conformism that makes a mockery of the values we pretend to hold. The first step towards political sanity must be intensive self-examination, exposure not only of what we do and what we represent in the world today, but also of the attitudes that color and distort our perception of our international behavior. A remarkable expression of these attitudes appears in a deservedly famous article by Neil Sheehan, written on his return from three years as a war correspondent in Vietnam. 52 from his direct observation, 
he concludes that for its own strategic and political ends, the United States is protecting a non-communist Vietnamese social structure that cannot defend itself and that perhaps does not deserve to be defended. Idealism and dedication are largely the prerogative of the enemy. In Vietnam, only the communists represent revolution and social change and despite their brutality and deceit, remain the only Vietnamese capable of rallying millions of their countrymen to sacrifice and hardship in the name of the nation and the only group not dependent on foreign bayonets for survival. On our side are the military and the mandarins drawn from the merchant and landowning families who had collaborated with the French just as they collaborate with us. Dot 53 he points out that the existing social system defends privilege and that many young Vietnamese of peasant origin join the Viet Cong because the communists offer them their best hope of avoiding a life on the rung of the ladder where they began at the bottom. He describes the new construction in Saigon. Virtually all luxury apartments, hotels and office buildings financed by Chinese businessmen or affluent Vietnamese with relatives or connections within the region, destined to be rented to Americans, while Saigon's workers live, as they always have, in fetid slums. 245. American power and the new mandar are Ryanair on the city's outskirts, be it these are the lucky ones lucky, that is, in comparison with the more than a million refugees, most of whom have left their homes because they could no longer bear American and sad Vietnamese bombs and shells all the hundreds of thousands killed and wounded, victims largely of the extraordinary firepower of American weaponry, often turned against helpless villagers by simple South Vietnamese officials. 54 he describes the American strategy as one of creating a killing machine and then turning this machine on the enemy in the hope that over the years enough killing will be done to force the enemy's collapse through exhaustion and despair. 55 the enemy being, for the most part, the rural population of South Vietnam. Sheehan concludes this account in the following way, despite these misgivings, I do not see how we can do anything but continue to prosecute the war, although he cannot fail to ask himself whether the United States or any nation has the right to inflict this suffering and degradation on another people for its own ends. The reason any other course might undermine our entire position in Southeast Asia. Many people have commented on the disparity between the contents of this article and the conclusion that she expresses. But there is a more important point that has received very little attention. She begins his account by saying that when he arrived in Vietnam, he believed in what my country was doing in Vietnam, with military and economic aid and a few thousand pilots and army advisors. The United States was attempting to help the non-communist Vietnamese build a viable and independent nation-state and defeat a communist guerrilla insurgency that would subject them to a tyranny. 246. The Logic of Withdrawal He is disillusioned only because of the devastating consequences for Vietnam and its people to which this attempt led. But he still does not question that we had a perfect right to use military force to determine the structure of South Vietnamese society and to defeat an insurgent movement which we had decided would subject them to a tyranny. There is no aggressor in history who could not have provided similar justification for his actions and many have offered precisely such Hello? justifications. The assumption that we have the right to impose yeah. our will on the Vietnamese in the best interest, hey, of course, is almost unchallenged. Okay. It is for this reason no, that girl. one cannot be too hopeful about no, the prospects no, of I'm reaching the real American uh, opinion in any fundamental way. The central uh, issues of war and freedom and national self-determination. There are few who challenge the assumption that we have a perfect right to determine okay, the legitimate so elements in South Vietnamese society, right, but it is forced to impose the social and political institutions that we, in our wisdom and benevolence, 
have selected for South Vietnam so long as this attempt is not too costly to make it worthwhile. The spectrum of responsible opinion stems from those who proclaim openly that we have this right to those who formulate our goals in a way that presupposes it. As to the latter, consider the final report to Congress by Defense Secretary McNamara, probably as sane a voice as one is likely to hear in Washington these days. We are fighting in Vietnam, he says, to preserve the principle that political change must not be brought about by externally directed violence and military force. But it is, in his view, perfectly legitimate for externally directed violence and military force to be employed to guarantee political stability that is, when it is the United States that exercises this force. In fact, 247. Emirikan Power and the new Manda are Ryanair. Go still further. We even have the right to use our military force to carry out political and social change. First, the pacification program, which is under American military control, involves nothing less than the restructuring of Vietnamese society, but it is, in his view, a legitimate, in fact laudable program.56. Thus the principle that we are fighting to preserve is not the principle of non-intervention by military force in the affairs of the nation. Rather, it is the principle that the United States and the United States alone may intervene in the internal affairs of other nations to guarantee political stability and even to restructure their society. Secretary M. C. Namara is of course aware of the fact that the role of North Vietnam in externally directed violence has always been, and now remain, far slighter than our own. It is the department that he headed the Department of Defense that has provided most of the evidence on this matter. But North Vietnamese interference has been in support of social change of a sort that we define as illegitimate whereas ours is in support of stability, or occasionally, restructuring, that we have determined to be quite proper, to be concise. We are fighting in Vietnam in fulfillment of our role as international judge and executioner nothing less. Secretary McNamara's formulation of our goals in Vietnam is given in calm and measured tones and is for this reason deceptively reassuring. With less certainty, the same presuppositions are expressed in the words of a congressman from Texas 20 years ago. No matter what else we have of offensive or defensive weapons, without superior air power America is a bound and throttle giant, impotent and easy prey to any yellow dwarf with a pocket knife. 87. 248. The logic of withdrawal. What is important in such statements, as this is not the undercurrent of racism, though that is bad enough, but rather the notion that we are easy prey to these yellow dwarves with their pocket knives. Obviously, we are easy prey to them only in their countries, right, so where we have a perfect right to be. Why do we have this right? The answer has been given by many statesmen America. and scholars. It is in our national interest. President Johnson has expressed the matter quite clearly on occasion, for example, in the following statement, November 2nd, 1966. There are 3 billion people in the world, and we have only 200 million of them. We are outnumbered 1s 